<clears throat> okay, so does anyone have any questions? Is there any questions, any concerns right now? Are we okay? All right, all right. Hello? Yes, Abu, my friend, my compatriot, how are you? <laughs> yes, sir, how can I help? Um, Abu. For, those yeah. that, for those that ask uh, the extension in the homework, uh, yes. did you grant uh, Shabby from the last one? I couldn't hear what you said. You, you have something crackling in the background. Did you grant um did you yeah, grant no, for you, you sent me an email. You sent me an email about your situation. I'm not going to discuss that pri up, up, up openly, you know, but those yeah. people that asked me, I did whatever they needed. I try to be accommodating. That's the goal, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what is, what's the purpose of being in this class? I want an A. Everybody wants an A. Of course, we all want an A. Nothing wrong with yeah. that. Yeah. Right? But I think more importantly than the A is to learn something. Mm -hmm. We need to learn something. Apply and so, those negotiation skills. Yeah, right. The critical question is how can we learn stuff so we can lower the tension? Think bad things, challenges are going to happen in each one of our. Uh, hopefully, uh, all right, no problem, no problem. Uh, and, uh, each person, every single person is going to have to have challenges in their life. The question is how do we negotiate with those challenges that happen personally and professionally? Yeah. Right. Do, do you know? Do you know the status regarding the uh, tutoring for thirty-four thirty-one? I don't know yet. That's a very interesting. So I know that the dean mentioned it. I know that I put in for that course to be included, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to find out. I'll ask the dean today. I'm going to ask. I'll have, a, have to call him about something else. I did not remember to do that, but I will ask him today about that, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, Thank I'll you. No problemo. <laughs> We're here together. I'm living the dream. Anybody else have any questions about what we've been doing or, or learning? Because we're going to take a not a brief respite, but I want to introduce a concept. A lot of times what I would do, <clears throat> in the last two or three years is to have you guys attend a seminar, no cost, a free seminar on nonviolent communication. All right, remember? And I gave you guys a little taste of that the last time we were together. I think I showed you, I know I did. I showed you pot potato chip man, right? <laughs> potato chip guy, everybody remember that? I do have a question. Yes, Samuel, what's the question? I caught it in the chat before it disappeared. Samuel, what's the what's the question? Um, well, you mentioned paper. Was that the like the homework or? Yes, that was the homework. Don't be, don't worry, okay. don't worry. <laughs> I'm saying you just out. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Say, wait a second, maybe I'm missing something. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. You're okay. I get it. I get it. Trust okay. me. Better to ask that question than to be like, but I thought, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm not one of those professors. Who go, yeah, right. <laughs> You know, professors always have that look, don't worry, I won't hold it against you. When you know full well, they will hold it against you. Every one of us knows it. <laughs> I'm not going to hold it against you. Oh, yes, I am. <laughs> you know, but I really am not trying to hold it against you because I really want you guys to learn stuff. I want you to appreciate yourselves and to have a sense that I can do it. Not me. You can do it. I can do it. Meaning I want you to feel that way. And I want you to have real skills when you leave here. You know, it's no good to get a grade, but not be able to advance in your job. It's good, no good to, yes, Sana. Hand is up. Hi, professor. Yes. So I have a question regarding the last homework assignment. Yes. So um, I did submit it on Blackboard, but I wrote the submission. And when I clicked submit, it just looks weird. Like it's on the side, it looks weird. So okay, I let, I, I, sometimes that happens. I'll take a look, Sana. I, I didn't notice that on your particular assignment, but... That does happen sometimes, you know. I don't take I don't take offense for some reason. I don't know how you do it, but sometimes if you click in the wrong spot, it goes in the wrong place. You know what I'm saying? I also emailed it to you, like yes. I, I sent it as an attachment. Yes, so I saw hopefully that. you got it. Okay, I, got okay. That. No, I did get that. I did get that. So Thank no, you. No question about that, son. I saw that. I was like, hmm, okay. okay. But I don't think there was anything wrong with it before. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inquiring. You know, that's how we learn. That's how we get better. You know, so much tension, so many things are going on in the world today. And the question becomes, how do we make things better? Right? How do we make things better um, for each other in this world of sometimes seeming increasing tensions, right? We seemingly be in a world of increasing tension. So I want you to see at the very beginning, we want to learn how, if we can learn how to be more mindfully compassionate to each other on an individual basis, and then on a community basis, then on a collective basis, and when I say collective basis, I mean our states, our countries, our world, then perhaps we won't have to be have the sort of Damocles about 
nuclear attacks or invasions. We, the, the, the peace that we seek in the world begins with us. And you say, well, how, how much can I do? What can I do? I'm just, in, I'm just from Brooklyn. I'm going to Brooklyn, baby. I, you know, I'm not running things. But one day you could be, and one day you will be. Hello? Yes, yes, sir. Um, in negotiations, you can see it clearly in politics too, right? Look at of course. Uh, the Ukraine right now. They're not finding a solution with regard well, to That's that. why they need, they need people like you, boo. They need people from this class. They need people who, who are looking to find a way to explore the dignity of each person that we meet. Yeah. If we look at people as obstacles instead of opportunities, we're always going to have friction. But if we look at someone else as they have an opportunity, so that's the subtle message that I'm saying to you. Remember, I said, should we go second or should we go first? We need to go first. And I'm going to show you how to begin that process with yourself because the first person you negotiate with is who? Yourself. yourself. You need to know your nose. So your yes has meaning. It's really important. Keep your human dignity at all times. It's very important. All right, so let's watch the video and go from there. Watch everybody. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. This is this an introduction to nonviolent communication? It's not the greatest video, but it's I think apropos. It's appropriate. You'll learn something from it, hopefully, and we'll discuss it. Here we go. Let's pay attention. Here we go. And let's watch the video. Hopefully you can see. I was thinking, shall we spend the evening together tonight and cook together? Mm, I can't tonight. I'm meeting Clara. We go for a drink. Oh, come on. Like yesterday you went to play ping pong and the other day with your parents and then you go to the cinema. Well, it's a bit exaggerated. It's not exaggerated. It's just I find it really selfish of you that you just don't care about the relationship. Selfish? What do you want? What's what? your problem? I it's... care a lot about the relationship. Yeah, the only thing we are doing together, Oriane, is sleeping in the same bed. What's going great. On what with a great you? relationship. Yeah, I told you that this week would be busy for me. And what do you yeah, want? There is always what do you something. talk like this to me? Yeah. I'm not, what? Okay, you don't want me to speak like this? I will not speak. Well, what do you want, Yoram? Like, well, I can say... I have something else than my boy? friend in my life you want me like you want me to be like my grandma all the time in the kitchen I, i'm saying just that you are never available yeah you see you, you see you don't again. listen you no you don't listen me. you put pressure on me i'm sorry i'm not putting pressure i'm like just when you talk like this to oh, me. God. yeah so what is going on between people you know, even people who love each other they sometimes hurt each other so much what is going on you know when i was in school I was taught mathematics and geography and history and many other things that I never used in my life. And nobody was teaching me what I would clearly consider as the most important life skill, which is communication that will serve you in whatever you do in your life. Do you know this phenomena, for example, that people fall in love and then they get married and then they need a lawyer in order to divorce? Like, what's going on between people? Or I read an article that says that the number one reason for people to quit their job is human relationship, is conflict between, you know, with the boss or with their colleagues. Like, what is going on between people? And I'm not even yet speaking about war and politics and stuff like that. Like, what the f is going on between people? So if communication and connection between people is so important, what is the source of conflict? I work as a mediator and in 99% of the cases, when I go down the layers of conflict to see what is the cause, I see one pattern, which is judgments. And when I was introduced to nonviolent communication, I was curious how many of my thoughts are coming in a judgmental language. So I bought myself a little booklet and I put it in my pocket and I went into the world. And each time I had a judgmental thought, you know, like, you are arrogant, she is selfish, I'm stupid, I was just writing it down. After three days, my book was full. But full, I mean, in both sides of the paper. So learning nonviolent communication, it became very clear to me that judgment is a tragic description of reality. Or in other words, it's a lie. It's a human invention. It's it's a way to be honest that is not really describing what is really happening in reality. So what do I mean with judgment is a lie? Let's imagine that there is a book here and you read the book and I read the book. 
and you say, oh, this book is really boring. And I say, no, this book is so interesting. Like, what happened? Listen to the language that we speak. You say, the book is boring. And I say, the book is interesting. What happened to the book? The book entered into a kind of existential question. Am I boring? Am I interesting? And I would say the book is not boring and the book is not interesting. The book is just a book. And judgment is a tragic description of a certain experience that we are having. And we are not very skilled to describe this experience. So it's relatively easy when we speak about books and it becomes more complicated when we are speaking about people. So as Marshall Rosenberg say, the founder of nonviolent communication, every judgment is a tragic expression of a beautiful need. Each time somebody is judging you, it's actually, it has nothing to do with you. It's, it's an expression of a need that they have. So what, what is it when I said to Oriane, for example, you are so selfish, you don't care about the relationship. What was my need? What, did, what was the experience in me that I was trying to describe? Well, when I say you are selfish, is it, I just, I love her a lot. It's funny, no, to say selfish, that's a weird way to say I love you. And you can notice that when I say you are selfish, that does not motivate her to spend more time with me. So let's see how Orian would react if I share my need with her. So Orian, mm -hmm. I realize that I really miss you actually. Mm. And I really would love to spend time together. Mm. And I wonder, would you enjoy maybe tomorrow morning to take some time together? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Definitely. Yeah? yeah, tomorrow morning works. Cool. <laughs> but it's not always that simple. And what if she would say no? So, Rian, so mm -hmm. I was thinking, shall we take time tomorrow morning then? No, morning is really, really bad timing for me. So when Orian is saying no, it just means that there is another need that is wanting to be included. So let's guess what this need could be. You want to make sure that you take care of your running. Yeah, definitely. Running or yoga. Morning for me is really the, the best moment for my physical balance. Yeah, so you really want to take care of your balance. Definitely. You know how I am when I'm not in balance. Mm, yeah. Mm. So yeah, so she would like to care for her balance. And believe me, when her need for balance is not being met, it's not fun to be with her. So let's continue the dialogue to see how to include this need. Yeah, so, yeah, you really want to take care of your balance. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So do you have maybe an idea of when will be a fun time for you that we mm. can spend together? Well, actually, uh, tomorrow evening I'm available and, yeah, I would like to, to cook with you. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yay! <laughs> So this super simple principle of moving the dialogue first to meeting on the level of needs and only then come with creativity as to how to care for everyone's needs can be used on all levels. It can be used with couples, it can be used at work and also it can be used in politics. Watch this video how I was supporting a green organization to be in a negotiation with a Chinese minister. For example, I was working with like a a group of uh, green organization and they, they, they were in negotiation with the Chinese minister to stop fishing tuna fish because in two years there will be no more tuna fish in the ocean. So they made research during one year, they spent a lot of money to, to collect all the information of how to convince the Chinese, Chinese minister to stop, <laughs> to stop uh, fishing tuna fish. And they came to the Chinese minister and during two hours they gave him a lecture about how wrong it is to continue fishing tuna fish. And in the end they told him, so dear Chinese minister, you should stop fishing tuna fish. And guess what the Chinese minister said? No, I don't want. No way. My guess also he was not even listening to them during two hours. It's more than what a minister likes to listen. So I told them, okay, can I try to do this negotiation in nonviolent communication? So I asked one of them to play the Chinese minister. Then I told this Chinese minister, Dear Chinese minister, I have this research that is saying that in two years there will be no more tuna fish. So I'm really concerned for the ecological system 
Can you please tell me your reasons behind continue fishing tuna fish? And then the Chinese minister said, yes, I have 15 million people working in this industry. And then I said, thank you very much for giving me this information. And I said, well, so dear Chinese minister, I hear that there are 15 million people working in this industry. I really care for them. And I'm really worried that in two years they will have no more jobs. So are you open to negotiate with me to see how we can care for these 15 million people? And all the five, the five green pieces like, <laughs> were like, oh my God. So every judgment is a tragic expression of a beautiful need. So let's do an exercise together to experience it a little bit. So Oriane will show a demonstration and I would invite you to press pause between each step in order to use your own example from your own life. So step one, think of a situation from your life when somebody did or said something that you didn't like. Mm, well, when Joram said, you're selfish. Think of a situation in your own life that you didn't like. Go on. Step two, write all your judgmental thoughts about this person and allow yourself to be uncensored. Now we don't have to do that, but I want you to think about it. All the judgment, they're stupid. They didn't care. All those things that you might think about someone who's made judgments. I'm gonna send you, obviously we're gonna be able to see this video again. And I'm going to take this video and make it a separate link in a email to everyone so you can actually do this assignment. My judgments and censored. He's always judging me. He's putting his frustration on me all the time, like I'm his garbage. Yeah. So we'll so do that later. Step three. Connect with the need behind each judgment and use the need list that appears at the end of Orian's demonstration. We're going to see that in a second. Remember, we talked of things, I made it simpler than they do. Six human needs is one thing, and they're talking about a bigger needs list, and you'll see that in a second. Yeah, he's always judging me. That's my judgment. And yeah, first of all, it's very painful. Um... <sighs> Yeah, and, and also I realize I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared that we will get more and more distant. And I so want to be seen, you know, that I, I very much care about our relationship. And, you know, I have, I have other needs. And I even need support that, you know, to take care of, all, of this balance between all those needs. Let's stop there. I'm going to I'm going to stop this video so we can guess was that interesting? What does everyone think? Let me stop the course. See. What does everyone think for a second? Was that an interesting display of is that sort of realistic of what happens when we get into situations and discuss things with people that we assume we know what they're saying? Right? Maybe we don't. Maybe the judgments we make are nothing more than the hallucinations that we have in our own mind. I hope everybody sees what I'm saying here. We need to get out of our own way so that we can see things as they are. Okay. And so I'm going to share with you the list that they were going to show you. And I want to show you how powerful the six, remember I talked about the six human needs. I want to show you how varied they can be, right? A person wants to be need, see, say they want to be seen. What need are they expressing? Anybody remember? You say, I need to be seen. What are they saying? It's the number one rule for negotiators. We need to make the other person feel what? Significant. Remember that? Significant. There's six human needs. First one is certainty, variety, significance. Fourth is connection and love. Fifth is growth. And sixth is contribution. And so I'm going to show you this list, and I want you to be thinking about how do these needs and feelings fit into those six human needs. The reason why, because I'm going to show you right now, let me show you this list. 
Can you say, yes, I will send this to an email. Absolutely. If you find it interesting, absolutely. Let's take a look as I, and alongside the ABS. Good. Here we go. I hope everybody can see it. Here, a lot of times we say, how do you feel? Most people say, I'm all right. I'm doing okay. Look at how many things you could be feeling. How do you feel? I'm feeling curious. I'm feeling adventurous. I'm feeling alive. I'm amused. I'm astonished. I'm calm. I'm confident. I'm content. I'm curious. I'm delighted. I'm determined. I'm eager, ecstatic. I'm encouraged, excited, fascinated. I'm fascinated. I'm friendly, I'm giddy, I'm glad, grateful. Most people only have three or four experiences they repeat over and over again in their lives. And that's why they wonder why they're bored. Because they only, it's like having a piano and you only play two keys and wonder why you can't make a melody. You have to ask yourself, that's why I said the first person you're negotiating with is yourself. And sometimes people say sadness and manifest, I'm bored. I'm depressed, I'm just disheartened, I'm dismayed, despairing. These are ones that we feel a lot more time, uh, more, more often. Look at all of the ways we can express it. I'm anxious, apprehensive, bewildered. These are fear, all right? So what that list is what they were really talking about. So you have to have a lot of lists, but remember, no one's gonna memorize all these lists. The main point that you want to know is this that people are expressing some need that they're trying to get. Some need that they're trying to get. All right, it's very important, very important. Sometimes he, they cheated me. Well, cheated isn't the emotion, that's why they call it full feelings here. What because if the something... girl isn't selfish though? Where's that, where'd you see that, and which one? I'm saying, like, from the video, what if she is being selfish? Or like well, then, selfish? let's take a stop. Let me stop the share right here. Let's, that's this is real talk. Someone asks, what happens if a person's being selfish? What's the need you're not me getting met when you feel the person's being selfish? Is it the connection on? Yes, connection. You want to be connected. And you want to be significant. Those are the two, right? I said you can never go wrong in a negotiation to do what? Significance, even with yourself. I'm, and people, what, what people will frequently do, what they do instead of instead of expressing or a analyzing what need they have, they'll default to anger. Why? Why the person doesn't want to spend time with me? Screw them! I don't need them. Screw them! Screw them! Right? That's how we think. Why? Because when we're angry and our bodies are moving a certain way and we're speaking a certain way when we're angry, we feel what certain. Ah, one of the key human needs. That's why in a lot of religious traditions, anger can become a poison. We see it in the conflict in the world. I'm angry, you're angry. Ah. Certainty, and I want you to be this way because now I can be certain, I can have certainty. I can be significant. Hmm. So if someone's always you... that way, I don't know, I feel like, I feel like it's not really as much as how you look at it. It's just the person and they uh, need to fix themselves. Here's the whole thing. That's why it's very important to step back to know what you need, because guess what? Some Here's a key point. If I go up to a rock, never thought of this before, but I'm thinking of it now. If I go up to a rock and say, please give me water. How many times before I go to that rock, absent a miracle, <laughs> will, the, will the rock give me water? I don't know none. <laughs> the answer is, that's right, never. Some people can never fulfill your needs. But guess what? That's okay. That's okay. Because if you're going to go first and you're going to be loving, will everyone always be loving to you? No. They didn't like uh, Moses. They didn't like uh, Jesus, everybody. They didn't like uh, Buddha. They didn't like uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Every single person has been on the planet. Not everybody liked them even if they came to like everybody. So is it possible that you could like someone and them not like you back? Or not being as committed to you as you are to them? But a lot of times people say, I'm never gonna be in a relationship. I was in a relationship once when I was 10 years old. <laughs> and I know what it means, <laughs> right? But how many of you drive? How many of you drive in your life? 
and you get into a car and you go down a highway or you go down a one lane lane highway and you have to watch the other person and you have to you don't even know what's in their mind they could be crazy they could take their car and drive it right into yours and try to kill you but why do you get into a car not knowing what the other people are going to do why do you do that because how are you going to get from point a to point b if you don't what trust somewhere along the line you people earn trust and you build the trust but you have to go what if you say i'm never going to get in a car because those people on the line might be crazy you're not going anywhere you go first you know your nose person selfish to you you're loving you're loving they're selfish you're loving you're loving they're not right for you there are how many people on the planet now seven billion <laughs> and you think only one <laughs> no, you're under no obligation to be a martyr or suffer emotional, psychological abuse. You must recognize your beauty and be honest with yourself first. That's why knowing the six human needs, because you get caught up. I'm angry. I want to be seen. I'm tired of being alone. Right? That's real. Don't fake it. Unless you want to fake it till you what? Become it. And we need each other. We pretend like we don't, but we need each other. That's the part of the negotiation of life. Once you can admit you need other human beings, then you allow them to come into your life and you can come into their life. There's interbeing, there's an interrelationship of real power. It's a different way of looking at things. And you may say, well, this is all fantasy land, Professor. This is fantasy, fantasy, fantasy. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I don't know what drugs you're taking in the morning, but I don't take those drugs. I live in the real world, buddy. <laughs> I got real problems. <laughs> well, how about we put it to the test? Can I show you something that put it to the test? Is that fair? Real world? People hate you? Despise you? Hate the very being of who you are as a person? Let's see if it can work. Let's turn to the video. Let's go here. Let's share the screen again. I'm going to stop this particular video. And I'm going to show this video. Let's watch it. See if we can learn something. What do you do when someone doesn't like you? So a black guy walks into a bar. Sounds like the beginning of a, a bad joke. I see people shifting around a little bit, but it gets better. And the first thing he sees is everybody else in there is white. So he sits down at the piano on the stage with the band to play. And on the band break, a white gentleman comes up to him and says, you know, this is the first time I ever heard a black man play piano like Jerry Lee Lewis. Well, the black pianist tries to explain the black origin of boogie-woogie, rockabilly, and rock and roll to this gentleman, but he didn't buy it. But he wanted to buy this black guy a drink. So they went back to the table. He had a beer. The black guy had a cranberry juice. And they began talking. And then the white gentleman says, you know, this is the first time I ever sat down and had a drink with a black man. Well, the first thing that occurs to the black guy is this guy is having a night of first. And when he asked the white gentleman why, how can that be, the white gentleman revealed that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. Well, this guy was having a night of first. My first experience with racism occurred when I was 10 years old in 1968. My family had just moved to a place called Belmont, Massachusetts. And I was one of two black kids in my entire school, 10 years old in fourth grade. I joined the Cub Scouts, and we had a parade, a march, from Lexington to Concord, Massachusetts, to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. Somewhere down the parade route, as I was marching with my fellow scouts, I began getting hit by bottles, soda pop cans, rocks, and debris from the street by a small group of white spectators off to my right on the sidewalk. I had no idea that I was the only 
person getting hit until my den mother and other scout leaders came rushing over and huddled over me with their bodies and escorted me out of the danger. And they never explained why this was happening to me. And I had no clue. When I got home, my mom and dad were fixing me up with Band-Aids and Mercurochrome, and they explained to me why I was the target of these projectiles. At the age of 10, I formed a question in my mind, and that question was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? So years later, here I am, a college graduate with my degree in music, and I'm sitting at a bar at a table with a member of the KKK. I've been seeking the answer to that question for years, unable to find it. Now, here's my opportunity. For who better to ask than someone who would join an organization who historically, their premise has been hating those who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. Who better to answer that question, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? I persuaded this clan member to give me the contact information for the leader of the Ku Klux Klan. He reluctantly provided it to me on the condition that I not reveal where I got it from. The Klan leader's name was Roger Kelly. I had my secretary contact Roger Kelly because I decided I want to write a book. I want to sit down and, and, uh, and interview Klan leaders and Klan members all around the country and ask them that question. So I was going to start right there in Maryland, where I currently live. So I had her contact Roger Kelly and not but I was not, but asking if he would consent sitting down with her boss and getting an interview. So he agreed. I arranged the hotel room for us to meet him. And when he arrived with his armed bodyguard, they were shocked to see that I was black. And I could see apprehension on them. And I stood up and went like this to show I had nothing in my hands and invited them in. They came in, Mr. Kelly took a seat, and, and the bodyguard stood at attention to his right. He had his sidearm right here in his holster. And we started this interview process. Everything was going along fine. He let me know that indeed I was inferior due to the color of my skin. That made me inferior. But I wasn't there to fight with him. I was there to learn from him where these perceptions came from. Because in order to address something, you have to learn how they got there in the first place. So I'm listening. A little while later into this interview, a strange noise occurred, kind of a and we all jumped. And my eyes locked with Roger Kelly's eyes. I knew he had made that noise, because I didn't make it. And my eyes were silently asking him, what did you just do? Well, his eyes had fixated on mine, and he was silently asking me the same question. The bodyguard had his hand on his gun, looking back and forth between the clan leader and myself, silently asking, what did either one of you all just do? Well, my secretary realized what had happened. She had filled the ice bucket with ice and put cans of soda in there to be hospitable and offer everybody beverages. Well, the ice bucket was sitting on top of the dresser. The ice had begun melting and the cans of soda cascaded down the ice. And that's what made the noise. And we all began laughing at how ignorant we all were. But this was a teaching moment. I won't say anything was learned at that moment, but a lesson was taught. And that lesson was this. All because some foreign and underscore or highlight the word foreign entity of which we were ignorant, that being the bucket of ice and cans of soda, entered into our little comfort zone via the noise that it made, we became fearful and accusatory of each other. Thus, ignorance breeds fear. If we don't keep that fear in check, that fear in turn will breed hatred because we hate those things that frighten us. If we do not keep that hatred in check, that hatred will breed destruction. We want to destroy 
those things that frighten us and that we hate. But guess what? They may have been harmless and we were just ignorant. So we saw the whole chain almost unravel to completion had the bodyguard drawn his gun and destroyed either myself or my secretary. So like I said, we all began laughing and carried on with the interview and there were no more problems. Over time, Mr. Kelly would come down to my house and continue these interviews. He would even have dinner and lunch at my table or we would go out and have dinner and lunch. Now this was somebody who considered himself superior and me inferior. We continued this relationship. He did not invite me to his house. But after a couple of years, he began inviting me to his home. I would see his clan den. I'd take some pictures and some more notes for my book. Then he began inviting me to clan rallies. I'd go to these clan rallies and watch these clansmen and clanswomen in their robes and hoods parade around this big 20 to 30 foot cross, set it on fire, and it goes whoosh. And they parade around and give all these lectures take some more pictures and notes. Well, CNN wanted to do a story on this. They knew who I was through music, and they knew who Roger Kelly was through the Klan. So I'm, I'm going to show you this clip that was shown every hour for 24 hours on CNN and on HLN all over the world. And I want you to pay particular attention to what Mr. Kelly says. He says that even though he and I would do different things together, it did not change his views on the Klan, because his views on the Klan had been cemented in his mind for years. And then he goes on to say how he believes in separation of the races. But also listen to what he says about respect, and then listen to the commentary at the end that the two CNN anchor people give. Show the video, please. Welcome to this final hour of CNN Sunday Morning. I'm Bob Kane, and today for Miles O'Brien. Good morning to you all. I'm Joey Chun. Friendship can transcend all kinds of boundaries. Just look at us. And two men in Washington <laughs> area are showing that even an African-American man and a member of the Ku Klux Klan can find common ground. CNN's Carl Rochelle report. Cheryl Davis plays a hot piano. It's part of the show, and it makes him stand out. <laughs> He also stands out here. Davis is one of the few African Americans you will ever find attending a KKK rally. More than attending, he is welcome. I got more respect for that black man than I do you white niggers All out right. there. It's been a tough day for the Klan. Their Maryland rally found many local residents rejecting the message of white separatism. After it's over, Daryl Davis hangs around backstage with his friend, Klan wizard Roger Kelly. It's not unusual for blacks and whites to be friends, but it is unusual to find a black man and a Klan leader chatting pleasantly over an orange soda after a Klan rally. The relationship started over a book Davis was writing. His secretary set up an interview with Roger Kelly, but didn't tell him Davis was black. They talked and talked some more. Davis learning about the Klan, Kelly learning about Davis. We get to know one another and we do different things, you know. It's it hasn't changed my views about the Klan, you know, because my views on the Klan's been pretty much cemented in my mind for years. Kelly and his Klan friends go to hear Davis and his band. And Davis goes to their rallies. I sat on, on, on the front row and, uh, and listened to each of the Klansmen speak. Um, some things I agreed with, other things I did not agree with. Davis thinks that his presence promotes badly needed understanding. Hate stems, I believe, from fear, from fear of the unknown. And I think this is all across the board, regardless of whether it's the Klansman or anything else. But he has no illusions about the Klan. If he did, his friend would be quick to disabuse them. And I believe in separation of the races. I believe that's in the best interest of all races. Does he really? Or has friendship transcended the color barrier? Listen to Kelly at a Klan rally. I'm a Colorado man to hell him back, because I believe in what he stands for and he believes in what I stand for. A lot of times we don't agree with everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me. And I'll respect him to sit down and listen to him. The strange relationship of a KKK wizard and his black buddy. In Washington, I'm Carl Rochelle, CNN Sunday Morning. Strange. Good adjective. Strange. 
Certainly <laughs> not. Okay. You heard the Klan leader say that he respected me. What's up with that? He's a Klan leader. I'm a black guy. He said, we may not agree on everything, but at least he respects me to sit down and listen to me, and I respect him to sit down and listen to him. Very important, folks. If you have an adversary, you don't have to respect what they're saying, but respect their right to say it and have that conversation. We spend too much time talking about each other, at each other, past each other, and not enough time talking with each other. That is respect, okay? And as, thank you, as a result, as a result of that respect, over time, Mr. Kelly began rethinking his ideology and that cement that held his ideas together in his mind for so long began to crack and crumble and then fall apart. And then just a few years back, Mr. Kelly decided to give up the Ku Klux Klan. He renounced it and gave me his robe and hood. This is the robe of the Klan leader, right here. This is the same robe you saw him wearing in the video. And of course, this is the hood and mask. Keep in mind, when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting, they're talking. They might be yelling and screaming, but at least they're talking. It's when the talking ceases that the ground becomes fertile for violence. So keep the conversation going. People learn racism through dialogue. Somebody tells them about it. So if you can learn it through dialogue, you can also unlearn it through dialogue. So a black guy walks into a bar, sits down at the piano, and then a conversation starts. What'd you guys think? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Daryl. What do we see there? Because that's not what they're teaching us in the in the TV stations and on the TVs, are they? I wanted this is my phrase. I don't know if you're gonna like it or not, but this is my phrase. Mass media does not promote mass love or mass compassion. Mass media. Mass media does not promote mass love or mass compassion. So what's happened for you guys, you've grown up in an era when that would seem impossible because you, we're so busy yelling at the person, they have racism, they have racism. But if you continue to dialogue with respect, significance, notice he said respect. The most important thing I told you you can do in negotiation is to what? Respect someone, to see them. And unfortunately, we have grown up in a soup in the last five to seven to 10 years where they say, the person, because they have a view that disagrees with me, that means they're that. That's a judgment. Um, professor, can I? Yes, I love it. So this kind of reminded me of when, so in elementary school, um, we read this book and it, basically the theme of it was if you don't like someone, try to spend a day with them and then see how your views change after. Yes, absolutely. You guys don't know what I do, you know, outside of here, but we did the Love and Pilgrimage Walk um, about a year ago uh, when the large number of Asian Americans were being attacked here. And we helped my group, I'm a, I'm a member of a group called the Buddhist, uh, New York Buddhist Council, 
I'm a Buddhist, my practitioner, it's irrelevant, but I just wanted to say, we started to do that peace pilgrimage, the love walk in Chinatown with a lot of the Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Southeast Asian leaders leading the march. And so what's happening is there's there's a devolving. People are not willing to listen to each other or give people the chance to change. That man wasn't just a Klan member. He was the head of the Ku Klux Klan in his area, the head of his organization. But simply by being present and being compassionate and loving, he was able to what? Daryl was able to what? He was able to influence him. Because we he didn't control him, did he? He didn't put him in the basement and said, here's a gun, change your mind, buddy. You got five minutes to start talking sense. Your brain's gonna be all over the floor. That's what he did. What he did, did he just show up? Being himself and say, I'll listen to you. And so the clan member was expressing through his dialogue some need So the question becomes, are we willing to, if we can do that with people who hate us? I wanted, I love that video because it says what's possible. Don't tell me, grandma tells me to pick up the garbage. She don't like me. <laughs> right? 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 Let's times we're, we're in that place. So-and-so doesn't like me because they don't want to, you know, go out with me every Friday night. We need to ask ourselves what needs we need, what needs do they need? That's what the first video was showing and how we can have a mutual respect of needs. Now, the beautiful part is when someone says, I love you. And you say, I love you back. I love you too. I love you, I love you. At least you're starting from the groundwork of not despising and hating each other like in this video. But the key point was that we needed to see was simply, yes, Solomon. Yeah, I think this video is kind of like amazing. I don't know. I saw it a long time ago, uh, I think in like parts, but he had to be, you know, you could tell like he had to be very um, brave and like uh, just like it, it takes a lot for somebody because I'm sure to do what he did because I'm sure he, he experienced a lot of backlash and hate from the same guy that he's talking to. And he probably said disgusting things to him, but, but he, but he still stuck through it and he just sat down and then eventually he respected him for that. And then that became a stepping stone for what he could get out of it next. And then so on and so forth. So it was just like, it's crazy to see. And it's just like, it, it, to need more people like that. <laughs> well, the truth is I have, I have, I have, let me look right now. Let me look around. I got 45 such people right now in the zoom call. You guys are very courageous. It may not seem that way because nobody tells you that, but in a world gone mad, you are trying to bring sanity to the world. You get on the subway with people that they tell you to be afraid of. Asian men and women are being attacked. They're buying pepper spray by the gallons up in Harlem. People trapped in poverty still get on the train, come to Brooklyn College to try and make things better for their families and their families overseas. You don't realize how much power you're using every day he was able to do it in a public way with a public figure but you do it every day when you sit next to that person who society has told you to be afraid of automatically but still you come and you're in negotiation learning about how to go first kind of an interesting story don't you think This is not my happiness class, but this is the negotiation class. Because the key person we need to negotiate with is who? Ourselves. We need to know our stories. So hopefully, I don't know if you've been reading the books, one of the things is talking about stories. That's gonna be the final sort of paper, hard paper. Stories. What are the stories we live by? The things, you notice he said fear. He said, remember the, the, the machine, the ice went shh, And he said, I showed him my hands like this. Remember we saw that in one of the videos? The universal sign of what? 
exact words were, I come in peace. So we hear people, we have significant others, girlfriends, boyfriends, significant others who we're not getting along with, we're fighting, the person feel, appears to be selfish. Can we open up ourselves, full kimono, they call it in a negotiation, you know, a person goes half kimono, in person kimono means you're naked, in Japanese kimono is the thing that they wear sometimes, so full kimono means I open myself totally up to see you. Are we willing to be vulnerable? That's why I said in the six human needs, most people will settle for what? Connection instead of love. Because you might hurt me. But we get on roads every day. Why do you think I gave you that analogy? We get on roads with people we don't even know. And we do something every single day to get from point A to point B, but we're not willing to negotiate with the people in our lives who we say we love the most. So I'm getting you to think about your life in a different way. And negotiation just doesn't mean all of a sudden, you say, well, I just wanted to figure out how I can get more money from a car. You're going to learn how to do that. I just want to get more money on my job. I'm going to teach you how to do that. But I want you to understand how powerful true negotiation is. True neg negotiation is life transforming. Because it tells you the why. What do I mean by the why? You know why you're doing stuff, the how gets easy. If you know why you're in Brooklyn College, then you'll, you'll, you're will you willing to fight for everything. Because it's not just a job. I hope you realize that. I know people don't understand that. Being in Brooklyn College is more than a job. It's a life-changing destiny move. Some of you have, you're the first people in your family to go to college or a continuation for you of a long line of people who struggled. I don't care if your father's a dentist or what. People, you you know someone who they told you about someone in your family, if it's not your mother and father or somebody who's taking care of you, you know somebody who struggled. And they always remind you, so-and-so did this. <laughs> you think, God, I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> but let me tell you something. You are the fruition of that struggle. And you are changing that destiny for those people who struggle, who couldn't even imagine their grandchild or their child going to Brooklyn College and getting out and having a college degree and being able to help the family and go forward and have children and do whatever they want to do. Don't cheapen your life. Don't cheapen your life. So we are in times of interesting times, a lot of struggle, a lot of battles going back and forth. But I wanted to make sure you knew this story today. Does this make sense to everybody? So what did he go? Did he wait? Did, did, did he wait? Did he wait? Did he wait until the Clinton? Thank you, Jessica. Did, did he wait until the situation was right for him before people said, this is a safe space? No, he said, I'll go what? Second or third or first? So let me go first. I know who I am. I know my nose. I'm not going to demean myself. And if the end, the clan member said on the video, and that's what he said, wanted to point out. He said, I, he respects me and I respect, I respect him. Doesn't mean we have to agree. Everybody wants everybody to agree with them. And that's one of the, hey, you want to know a secret? And I always have an advantage because I'm, yes, sir, son. No, finish your point. No, 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 no. Uh, that secret is I'm always willing to go first. Even if I'm quiet, I'm going first. Send me, I'll go first. People said, I said, why did I say I did all these different jobs and I got to do this and I was in a rock band and I was a, a professional actor and I'm chairman of this and I have a company and I'm the president of the Buddhist council and I sit on the parliament of world religions and I sit on the, the, the executive board of the religions for peace, which is the largest national organization in the United States. And I'm on the major transition team for, for religious people. I'm on the God squad trying to stop urban violence with guns. Why? Because I go first. That's the secret. That's my secret sauce. Nothing special about me at all. Yes, Solomon, what's your question? 
No, I just wanted to add, like, you could, you could obviously tell, like, that, that the, at the, uh, the head member, whatever, of the Ku Klux Klan, he was, like, he was, like, back and forth with his words, like, he wasn't really saying the truth a lot of the time, he was only saying it, like, when it, like, strongly, like, you know, like, when he said, I'd follow him to the, like, from the end of the world and back or something like that, like, that's what he was really feeling and then on the news when he said oh i didn't really change my my perception or anything like that you could tell he was having some like internal sort of you know like conflict or something trying to figure out what's going on why 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 would it that's a great point why would he have conflict why do we all have conflict because why did he have conflict because things were changing he was outside of his comfort zone and and then it it, it was starting to alter things and he just like I guess, like, obviously, when, like you said, he, he thought something was super cemented in his mind and things started to, you know, crack and crumble, he couldn't understand why it's, and until he had further, you know, depth and clarification. Powerful. Very good point. Sometimes we lock ourselves into positions and then we forget why we were arguing. Don't be that person who says, I have to argue just so I can win. I'm right, and I'm in my kitchen eating my tuna fish out of the can <laughs> by myself. I'm right, I tell you. <laughs> We're 70 year old. I'm 70, and I'm right. <laughs> right? People are insane. They'd rather be right than loving, right than kind, right than joyous, right and compassionate. <laughs> They'd rather be right and alone than committed and loving. I'm asking you, what are you going to do with your life? Yes, we're going to learn negotiation. We're going to learn mirror matching. We're going to learn how to influence people in already. We already have. I hope you've been paying attention. The first video, Amy Cuddy, I showed you. Change your body posture. Do like this. Move your hands. I didn't teach you that, but move your hands in rapid fashion. When you feel depressed, we all know the ritual of feeling depressed, don't we? We don't go, hey, I feel depressed. I don't know what to do. I, that's not how people are depressed. <laughs> Yeah, everything's kind of all right. I don't know how. <laughs> you know how it is. I don't even like to play that game because I don't want to have that physio physiological neurology happening in my body and my mind. I have too many things I want to do to be in relationship with other people. First thing, though, go what? First. Because then you determine how your neuro neurobiology is going to be impacted. You smile first. Jack, I started doing yoga this week and now my posture is better and it's all because I watch you feel good. Go first. Go first. Go first. I keep repeating it because it's so anti it's so antithetical. It means antithetical means opposite what we know, antithetical to what we're being told in the media. Be afraid. Don't like that other group. They can't relate to you. They don't know you're suffering. No, they never will. Isn't that great? <laughs> I don't know what it means to be a person from uh, XYZ country. Isn't that great? Because that means I can do what? I can listen and learn something. I'm an African-American born in Brooklyn, baby. I'm from the Brook. I'm real Brooklyn. I'm as Brooklyn as you get. I ain't I am not trans. I was born in Brooklyn. Brooklyn Women's Hospital doesn't exist anymore. That's how Brooklyn it gets. <laughs> you know what I'm, I'm Brooklyn. Hardcore. Right? But that's what I'm telling you. Lessons from Brooklyn. You go first. You change your world, change your thinking, change your perspective on things, and you can change the world. Maybe if we had more people like the man's name, first name was Dale, if we had more men like him and more men and women committed to respecting and listening, we wouldn't have people, men, women, and children dying in, in Yugoslavia. Ukraine, I'm sorry, Ukraine. And in Russia. And in Yemen. Do we have the courage to just be ourselves? I'm not asking you, to, he wasn't anybody else. He was just himself. So hopefully we're getting this different sort of lesson today. Because I was committed to making sure you understand. People saying, what's this nonviolent communication stuff? What are we talking about? <laughs> what are we talking about? 
Well, I'm telling you what we're talking about. We're talking about changing how you see yourself. You know, you know, that's powerful. People see it. Hope, hope you see it because you're not don't don't think you're going to see it on the TV. That's why do you think I showed you in the previous class? I showed you a series of videos. Remember that we saw the videos where all the TVs were saying the same thing. Remember, we saw that at the beginning. We saw that video over and over again. I'm actually using the ABS formula, absorb, bypass, and stimulate an unconscious response. I absorbed your attention by showing you the video. I bypass your critical factor because you're seeing these. What the heck is going on? And stimulate it in the most response. You say, that's crazy. But I want you to see that's what the media is doing to you. It's making you have automatic push-button feelings so that you don't listen and care about whomever, the black person, the, 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 the Muslim person, the Jewish person, the white man. You don't want to listen. And who says that's the way to go forward? It's the way to go forward if you want to hurt each other. You hurt him. You fear and hate that which you don't know. So that's the class for today. Hopefully we got something out of it. Was it hopefully it was worth the worth the time of admission because your time is more valuable than your money. Your time is more value than your money. People lose money and get money back, but you can't get your time back. Are we okay today? You can feel your thinking. Hope you saw the video. Hope it was worthwhile to see. And you can see we're going in a different direction. But the next direction, the next one is, what is your story? Who are you? Who are you? Are we okay, everybody? All right. Yes. All right, everybody. We're going to go. If anybody has any questions going forward, we'll do hit them later. But I'm thankful. So if you didn't get your paper in, get it in soon. <laughs> get it in. <laughs> right? Get it in soon so we can all be on the same page so you can keep up with the lesson. Thank you, everybody. Have a beautiful afternoon and a tremendous weekend. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you for Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. It's great seeing you. Bye.